Why Smart People Hurt. Hi, I'm Diane Allen, the host here at Someone Gets Me, and I have a great expert and guest with me today, Matthew Zakreski. I'm going to get it. it. <laughs> I got his name right. I've been practicing his name because it's important to say the name right. And Dr. Zakreski is an amazing, talented, gifted man, and he's in Pennsylvania, and I'm in Florida, so He's got the humidity today and I don't. So we switched it up in the weather. Now we're here today to really talk about why smart people hurt. Now, Matt is an expert in giftedness and he is an expert working with people in that area of the world where our brains develop different, the way we see things is different, and the world is really a different experience than what people might typically think. I use the word visionary a lot because they're very similar and sometimes people don't understand the nuance. And the reason why we're going to talk about why smart people hurt today is because smart people feel the world very differently. It lands on them differently and it hurts sometimes. So I'm planning on unpacking some of the causes and most importantly, some of the solutions that can, you can act on today. So you might want to get your pen and your paper, grab your coffee, and hang out with me and Matt while we talk about this exciting topic that also reminds us that we're all human and we're all just getting through this together. So take the information and by the end of the show, you'll know how to contact Matt if what, you, what he says really rings true for you and he'll be happy to support you in any way he can, along with myself, of course. So welcome to the show, Matt. It is such a pleasure to be here. This is going to be a blast. I'm so excited because you're an expert in dealing with smart people, gifted people. And, and I think that all the visionaries I work with and all the visionaries that listen to this show are also gifted, whether they know the word or not or understand it or not. Not everybody knows the language. So I use it interchangeably mm -hmm. in this situation. So I'd like to start off with a little bit, if you could tell us a st the story a little bit about, about your journey. Has there ever been a time where people didn't understand you? And when did you figure out you were smart? How did these kinds of things become of interest or come into your radar so that you could like create the rest of your life? Yeah. And I mean, and to say again, I, I, it, is, it, it feels surreal to be on, in, in the podcast chair as, as opposed to sitting in my car listening to you. So I, I'm like still kind of geeking out. Um, but, you know, so I, I often describe myself as a grown-up gifted kid. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I identify with that. I feel that. Mm -hmm. And I think it, uh, it enables me to do my job as a psychologist pretty well because I remember what it's like to feel the highs, the lows, the parts that fit and the parts that don't fit. Mm -hmm. So my journey to giftedness starts, um, and it's a funny story. So I'm, I'm two years old, and I'm at our, uh, our daycare. And the woman calls my mom. My mom is also a psychologist, incidentally, so is my dad. Uh, Dr. Skresky, Dr. Skresky. And my mom picks up the phone. Yes. She goes, Matt did something. To, and my mom, of course, first time parent, and me like, did he fall down the stairs? Did he drown? Was he attacked by a bear? And she goes, he, he wrote the word Australia. And the woman, the woman is, is in a panic. And my mom says, I'm sorry. He, he wrote the word Australia? And she goes, yes. He picked up a crayon and he wrote the word Australia on a piece of paper. And my mom said, that's interesting. Why are you calling me? And she said, I've never, I've been working with kids for 20 years. No one has ever written the word Australia at two years old. And my mom said, I'll pick him up at four. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, my, and my mom told that, has told that for my whole life, right? And it's that first inkling that something was different about me. You know, fast forward a couple years, I'm in second grade. They give us a math workbook. And they say, you're in the math workbook, go home and do pages one and two for homework. So I went home and I did pages one and two for homework. And I said, well, that was easy. I'll just keep going. Kind of like Forrest Gump, right? Got to the end of the driveway. So I kept going, you know? Mm -hmm. So I finished, I came back in on Monday and I put the book down on my teacher's desk, Miss Vaughn. And she sent me to the principal's office. Because clearly something was wrong, right? I had cheated or, 
And I remember even as a second grader thinking, that's not right. Because clearly I'm doing something that somebody else can't do. Why do I have to go talk to the principal about this? Right. right? Like, why am I being, why am I getting negative attention for this? Um, so, you know, our, our district didn't have a great gifted program, but I was able to participate in it. And my journey really takes off when I went to CTY, Center for Talented Youth, uh, camp uh, summer after sixth grade. And this is, you know, when we today we're here to talk about why smart people hurt, right? And I think this, you know, all three of these examples are going to sort of show <laughs> the different layers of this. For this third example, I was getting ready to go to camp. Now, I'm super excited about this. I get to live on a college campus. I get to eat all the French fries I want. That was very important to me. Right. It still is, actually. <laughs> um, and and I, I remember my mom had taken me out to dinner with a couple of my friends. It's like sort of a goodbye. I'd be gone for three weeks. And we were dropping my friend Steven off at his house. And he's like, hey, I made you something. And it was a little, a little like clay figure. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is your nerd protector. Like when you go to your nerd camp, this will keep all the nerds away from you. And I remember sitting in the back of my oh. mom's minivan going, thanks. Because I'm like, I am one of those kids and I have to work so hard to pretend that I'm not. Mm -hmm. Right. I have, you know, like, I can't talk to you about how the fact that I read comic books because, you know, like that was not cool in the mid nineties. You know, I can't talk about the fact that I'm super excited to spend all summer doing creative writing. You know, like we get, you know, you give the spin to your friends. Oh yeah. My parents wanted me to do it. I'd much rather go to, what is it? Baseball camp. Uh, yeah. Baseball camp is sounds great. I want to stand in a field and have balls hit at me very hard. That sounds terrible. I don't want to do that. But so, and my mom, so Stephen gets out of the car and, and here's the thing, super well-intentioned, super nice guy. And my mom's like, you okay? I'm like, no, I like, how, how does he not get it? How does he not get that I'm, that I'm excited about this, that this is who I am? You know, so I think about those stories and, you know, that first summer at CTY was transformational. And, you know, I, I did five years as a camper and I went back and I was an RA, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's the sort of thing that my journey into and through giftedness, I think has been easier and more actualized than most, but it still has these moments of pain, right? Right. Because when you're a peg that doesn't fit into the system and how the system wants you to fit, there's friction. And in my line of work as a psychologist, right? Friction means pain, right? Mm -hmm. And now not all pain is bad pain because oftentimes that friction you're feeling is you right. growing and you're breaking the boundaries and the, and right. the box that someone's trying to put you in. You say, no, this is, you want me to be this small. I'm going to be this big. Visionaries aren't small. Visionaries no. are big, mm -hmm. right? And to do that, to get as big as you need to go there is pain in that process because the world wants you to be one way and you can't be that way. It's like inherently it's not possible. And, <laughs> and, and even though we may try to fit into it or whatever, I always kind of see it as like a form of static. There's like us and then there's the static around that we have to kind of negotiate to sort out how we're going to expand beyond it or what we're going to do with it. Or, you know, and sometimes it's oppressive and sometimes it's just annoying and, and, but it still is there until we really um, start working on the other side of it and it creates pain and it creates a, a hurt in, in people who feel not understood for whatever reason. And those examples you gave are like so, so true. I have a, a gifted kid I'm working with right now and he had a friend in school and she, they're just, they were just friends. It wasn't his girlfriend or anything. And she had her birthday party and um, she had acne on her face mm -hmm. and like most teenagers do. And he is the most sensitive kid in the world. And so he gave her for her birthday acne cream for her skin, thinking he was helping her. Yeah. He, he wanted her to feel better about herself because right. he knew she didn't. Yeah. And of course, she took it totally the other's way. And he couldn't, it took a while for him to see that his intention was a good one and how it got translated out into the world. And how she received it and how it landed on her was quite different. And so yeah. he, there, you know, so both of them 
here these two gifted kids are both being misunderstood yeah. by each other and, and not really sure how to do it because it's a little awkward sometimes, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I really felt for both of them, but I could see his heart. He says, well, I just wanted to give her something that I knew would help her. Yeah. And that's really what his, his motive was. Yeah. You know, he cared about her. So it's, it's a very interesting journey. Isn't it? Very. It's like sometimes I go, oh, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. How did that work out? <laughs> so yeah. let's, yeah. I want to talk a little bit when it talks about be gifted people and smart people hurting. What do you see as a good step? If somebody says, yeah, I kind of feel like I just, I feel hurt. Like some people have like that chronic um, sadness or that chronic grief that's just kind of Maybe it maybe feels existential or may or may not be just kind of there and it keeps surfacing once in a while. First of all, do you see that in people? And second of all, what are some things that maybe somebody could start to look at or do to, to help them begin to have awareness of the hurt in order to do something or, or at least be able to express it to somebody in a way where they can get some relief? Yeah. And I, I mean, I think you named it beautifully, right? There's this hurt that sort of exists. And one of the things that I argue a lot is that to be the best version of yourself, you need to be in the best situation possible. You know, if a flower doesn't grow, we don't blame the flower. We change the soil. We give it more sunlight. We give it more water. We give it special mm -hmm. plant food. Right? I don't sit there and yell at my daffodils, why aren't you growing? Right? <laughs> I, I move them and I protect them from my deer because the deer is just going to eat everything. Right? So gifted people as a rule suffer from, from what I call the curse of competence. Mm -hmm. Now, I have had many jobs in my life. I have been a lifeguard, a soccer referee. I worked in a video store. For you kids out there, a video store is a place where you used to rent movies. It's a whole thing. That's a different podcast, so we'll talk about that one later. Right, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> I've worked in a bar. I was a travel agent. I was a researcher. I've drawn cartoons. I've done a lot of different jobs. Mm -hmm. And would you believe it? I was really, really good at all of them mm -hmm. because I am a very smart, empathetic person who figures things out, like a lot of gifted kids are. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't a great, I had no desire to be a soccer reef for the rest of my life, but I, you better believe I memorized the entire rule book mm -hmm. and knew exactly what the right calls were and got confident enough to make them. And, and so every job I had became this process of how do I leave this job? Because they're telling me I'm really good at it. And they want me to keep taking on responsibility and do more of it. And I hated it. I, I was like, this isn't what I want to do. This doesn't feed my soul. Right. But, you know, it's like, hey, we'll give you $500 if you referee this soccer tournament this weekend. I'm 15. And I'm like, okay. Turns out it was an adult soccer tournament. I had grown men in my face screaming. And I was like, that call <gasps> correct, right? With my, little, with my little whistle and my little flag, like... But that, it's the curse of competence. When you're mm -hmm. good at something, people make it hard for you to stop doing it. When I was a travel agent, every time I tried to quit, they gave me more money. And when you're 23 and you've got $200,000 worth of, grad, of college debt, you say, well, money is good. I will take the money, right? Mm -hmm. So part of it is understanding where you are on that cycle, right? Where are you in the curse of competence? You know, are you, did you find yourself, and it's amazing how many gifted people find themselves in like, oh, I have a couple of master's degrees and I'm like part-time teaching and I have a blog. I'm not really, you know, like you're doing these like hyper-functional things. But I, I, I. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of my clients, he's just said he wants to go and get a second doctorate because he's not really sure if his PhD in um, biochemical engineering is enough for him. PhD in biochemical engineering. Are you kidding me? There's like, what, 100,000 people in the country who could get that PhD? And he's like, I don't know. Um, so it always comes back to like living your values and what feeds your soul, right? Mm -hmm. I was a very good travel agent. If I had stayed at that company, and actually this is one of my other gifted kids stories, right? I was, I, I had just finished the sales season. We'd made a bunch of money, got my bonus. Hooray, hooray. 
And my boss calls me into a meeting and goes, hey, you've been here for a while. We're going to give you your own team. You're going to be a manager now. Salary increase. You get to take more travel. You get to do all these things. And I, yeah, I was like, that's awesome. I got to go home and think about it, right? You know, the, the classic delay technique to get more money. Right. Um, and I went home and, and I had what you could probably call a quarter life crisis, right? I'm 25, 26. Mm-hmm. And I freaked out because if I took that promotion, I would have been there for the rest of my life. Don't, don't get me wrong. Great company. Loved working for them. I mean, when you're 24 and you're single and there's like, hey, will you go to Greece for a week and check out some hotels for me? Yes, I will do that. That yes, that, right, right. Oh, God. yeah, a minute. Only <laughs> right now. Um, but I realized like, it wasn't feeding my soul. It was putting money in my pocket and giving me a bunch of stamps on my passport. And those things have so much value. So not discounting, right? One of my therapy rules is and not but. Mm-hmm. I was making a lot of money, but I wasn't happy. No, I was making a lot of money and I wasn't happy. Happy, yeah. different thing, right? So I went back in and I quit my job and they said, what? <laughs> um, so they offer you a promotion and you go back and quit your job. And nice. They were shocked. <laughs> they, well, and talk about curse of competence, right? They, he went to his boss and they came to me and said, okay, can you do us a favor? Can you stay on for an extra month? We will pay you a salary for the, this month and rewrite our training program because we need somebody to do that. And you're really good at your job. And I said, okay. So they paid me, uh, I don't remember, I think it was $4,000 to work there for a month and completely rewrite their sales training program. And I remember saying that casually to someone and they're like, wait, what did they ask me? Like, to me, that was a normal thing because curse of competence. I'm good at it. I understand it. I can communicate it. He's right. like, when I quit that job, they said, all right, here's a box for your stuff. The end, right? So... Mm-hmm. So because it's so easy to get stuck on that treadmill, you know, we don't, it's hard to leave jobs. And, but especially in 2020, it is more easy now, it's easier now than it's ever been to find a career in your calling, right? If you want to play Dungeons and Dragons, if you want to do that all day, there are professional Dungeons and Dragons leagues you could do a podcast, you could do a YouTube channel, you could go, to, you could go to cons. I mean, there are ways to, to make a living based off our passions that didn't exist 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Right. And, you know, I have a client I work with, he has a full scholarship to a major university because he's really, really good at Fortnite. Wow. Right. Yeah. Scholarship, like traditionally for, for the baseball players, football players, softball players, mm-hmm. soccer players, you know, but he is an amazing Fortnite player. So their esports team gave him a full ride to an elite school. So, and I tell people steer into your passions, right? Um, you know, it, and it's funny because when I do assessments, right. And I talk to my, fi- the families I work with, it's almost always the dads. We're like, well, you know, I mean, I, it's, uh, it's cool. It's cool that he's smart. I, I'm not saying he, sh- he shouldn't be smart, but like, wouldn't it be better if he did football? Because I, I did football and football was good, right? You have to use the word football a lot. And because, you know, and listen, the archetypal high school success story, letter jacket, cheerleader, mm-hmm. right? Right. If that's not who you are, if, if that's who you are, go for it. Play wide receiver, you know, just protect mm-hmm. your head. But like, it, you know, I tell parents, and it's, it's usually the dads, I'm like, there are cool kids. There are popular visionary kids in every pocket of every organization. They're the coolest kids in the theater club. They're the coolest kids in marching band. They're the coolest kids Mm -hmm. in AV. And, and you're going to find the best versions of those people when you follow your passions, when you follow the things that make you feel best about yourself. So set it up as an experiment, give a kid six months to do a thing they want to do. Right. And they're going to end up being happier and more successful doing that thing and probably make more friends and probably increase their self-esteem by, by following those threads rather than doing what they're supposed to do. You know, my, um, you know, I, my wife often teases me that my life is like a movie. And I think it's part of it's because I tell stories 
not, I'm good at telling stories. Um, but the, when I was a freshman in high school, mm-hmm. basketball tryouts and musical theater tryouts were on the same day. Now I had played basketball all my life. My dad's really good at basketball and I'm okay. You know, I can do all the things you need to do to play basketball. And if I had gone out for the team, I would have probably played on the freshman team and I probably would have been called up to junior varsity at some point. I never would have been a star on any team. I, I'm, a, I'm a grinder when it comes to sports. Mm-hmm. And then, so I'm holding my basketball shoes and I look to my right and there's the musical theater and that's where my friends were. And I took a deep breath and I ran into the theater and I was like, okay, here I am. And I auditioned and fun fact about me, I can't sing, I'm a terrible singer, um, but I can act and I can dance. So they took a chance on me and I came home and over family dinner, my dad asked me how basketball tryouts went and I took a deep breath and I said, I went to uh, auditions for the musical. And, and I'm telling you, I think my life in many ways hinges on this moment because my dad looked at me and went, cool, how'd that go? Just completely no judgment, no, like, what do you mean? It was, okay, cool, how'd that go? I said, well, I'm in the play and I'm going to be this part in the ensemble and I'm going to need to buy makeup and I'm going to need to take dance lessons. And, and everybody nodded and we just went about our day. And that was so seminal for me because you know, six months later, at the end of my freshman year, I have a group of friends that became my close friends that got me through high school. Right. I'm still in touch with to this day. And, you know, and then in college, like my, the theater kids became my close friends there. And I still am engaged in theater now as a, as a grown up. And it's, it's one of those things that I would have been okay playing basketball. I would have made some friends. I would have done fine but there's a huge difference for a kid between doing fine and doing well. And we want our kids to do well. We want our kids to feel good. And when we don't, that's when gifted people feel pain because it's this functional capability. It's this curse of competence, right? Mm. I'm good at this, so I should be happy. Mm. I'm not happy. You know, Matt, I tell people a lot that it's, it's not a question about what we can do. It's what are we called to do? And yeah. that's, that's what you're saying. It's the same thing. It's follow the thread of the soul, you know, and what are we called to do? Because you could drop any of us anywhere and we'll be able to do whatever it is we need to do. Mm-hmm. And that's not the point. The point is what are, what's our soul say? What are we called to do? And so as I listen, I'm listening to you and if, if I was like, if I, if I was an adult person listening to this podcast and listening to you and I right now, and you tell this story, cause it's so common, the stories that you're saying, it's so common and I'm going, yeah, but I'm an adult. You mean I should take like six months or so to try to follow my soul? Like if, if I'm an adult listening to you and the, and I'm going, yeah, but yeah, but I'm an adult and do, I don't even know if I have six months and where do I even start? What would be step one for that person? Do you think? So step one is my one hour a week rule. So this is the idea because change is hard, right? And say you, say you are you're the CFO of a company, you're making six figures, and you're like, I can't become a high school dance teacher because uh, you know, my salary, our like, benefits, all the, the very real questions we have to deal with, with as adults. Right. So I think, let's not think about where we're going to end up. Let's think about starting. Starting, we add one hour a week. Right. So if you want to be a dancer, can you commit to dancing one hour a week? It doesn't have to be all at once. Can you dance 10 minutes for six days? It's an hour, right? Mm-hmm. And then when you do that, report back to me. How do you feel? You feel better? You feel happier? Does your hip hurt because you've been dancing and you're X years old? Right. So then try two hours a week then three. And what ends up happening as you do it more, you, you realize like, if I'm going to do this more, I need to access more resources, access more communities. So maybe you take a dance class at the local Y and there you meet somebody and they say, oh, you know, actually um, I dance in this group. If you want to audition, well, maybe I audition for the group. And all of a sudden you find yourself being surrounded by more and more complete communities. And maybe it's the sort of thing you don't quit your job. 
right? Maybe you don't quit your job as CFO, but maybe you say, hey, I'm going to work in the office three days a week and I'm going to work from home two days a week because on the days I work from home, I'm going to dance. I'm going to go to my dance class. I'm going to hang out with my dance friends. Right. And that becomes the way you get the the best of both worlds. I always say there's no wrong way to do what you love as long as you're doing what you love. And if you keep- (laughs) I love that. Say that that again for everybody. Say that again for everybody. That's a good one. Graphics up on the graphics. We'll put them in post, right? There's no wrong way to do what you love as long as you do what you love. Love. (laughs) I love that one. That's a great one. It's a great one. And it's, and it's, it, it, and it's you know, one of my favorite things in therapy is it's simple, but it's not easy. The idea is simple, right? right. But doing it is complicated. I mean, yes. we have mortgages and debt and kids and partners and commutes and, right. But the thing is, those things are never going to go away. Those things are always going to be there. Instead of fighting them or waiting for them to stop right. to then make the change to what we want to do, we say, there they are. I see them. I'm going to turn this direction and focus on what I can do right now. And I'm going to start with one hour a week. I love that. I love that one hour a week rule and then like kind of stepping it up because mm-hmm. it, first of all, we can do anything for an hour. Right. And even when we break it up, it makes it easier. And it also, you know, I'm listening to it. I'm like, it also gives everybody a chance to say, is it really what my soul is calling me to do? I might think it's what my soul is calling me to do, but as I start going down that road, I might go, it's kind of fun, but it doesn't have the same feel that I was thinking I might be getting or whatever. And that gives you a chance to pivot or change or refocus without having gone all in in something that you may or may not be sure of and not you know, shirking all your adult responsibilities because now I'm going this way, you know, which some people do. Right. And so I like that balance a lot. That's, that's a very helpful thing. And it's kind of fun because I'm one of those who I can do both. I'll do the one hour rule week. And then the other stuff like this podcast, I had people say, you should do a podcast and share your information. I'm like, okay. Yep. And then I started the podcast. Everybody goes, what are you? Wow. That was fast. I said, it was a good idea. Yep. I know how to do it. I didn't know I was going to be doing interviews. Somebody asked to be interviewed. I'm like, well, I'll try that. Now I love doing interviews. And as an introverted empath person, it's fun because I get to meet all these neat people and talk about things that bring my heart joy. And um, so it feeds that part of my soul. But I didn't know that was coming. I was just like, oh, that'll be fun. I think I'll do that. (laughs) But then other stuff, I do the one hour rule. So I'm like, oh, I like that plan. That's like really fun. And I think it helps decrease that, that sadness and that pain. Yeah. of feeling disconnected and feeling maybe disenfranchised is to start. Cause then you start building that community, right. you know, little by little. So the socially awkward people who are afraid to build the community, like, yeah, I know maybe I should take that dance class, but I'm doing okay at home. I'm not sure I really want to step out. You know, is there something that that person should maybe pay attention to as far as taking the risk maybe to, reach out even when there's a part of them convincing themselves to stay home. You know how like we can overthink and and talk ourselves out of the very good thing. Right. And what would you say to that person maybe who's talking themselves out of what their, their heart and soul saying, go give it a try, give it a try. And our brains are so good at doing that because our brain's number one job is to protect us. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Where we are is safe. Our brains have analyzed the space. This is a safe space. There are no bears here. There might be bears outside, so let's stay inside, right? Yeah. And and it's this and you know one of the things I say to say to the people that I work with all the time is that fear tells you something. That fear tells you that the growth, whatever growth you want, is that way. Now it's up to us to decide if we want to listen to it. We may not be ready, right? It, we can't just flip a switch. But the idea is every time you check in with that feeling, is that feeling still there? Is that feeling of activation still there? Because it's telling you that's the direction you're meant to go. Now, mm. the road may twist and turn and there might be branches, right? But as a general cardinal direction, that's where you want to head. So instead of go, going straight ahead towards it, 
maybe we walk along the side of the road for a while, right? Maybe instead of taking that dance class, maybe you take Zumba at the Y, right? So you do something dance adjacent, right? Just you dip your toe in the water, you know? Maybe instead of playing in an adult soccer league, because you're not sure if you can play soccer as well as you did in high school, maybe you volunteer to coach the youth team. There is not a youth team in this country that couldn't use another volunteer coach, right? right. I, it's, it's funny, even though I wasn't good at baseball, when I wanted to feed my soul when I lived in Boston, I volunteered with a uh, Little League baseball team, right? They were right over the, uh, the bridge from us. And, you know, a couple of my friends and I, we would drop over there after work and we'd, it was very bad news bears, right? And, <laughs> but, you know, it was Boston, so it was wicked had to teach yeah. them. Um, and it was one of those things that it made me feel good, even though I wasn't, right. you know, my career has nothing to do with baseball, but at the time, that's what I needed. And, but by doing something that fed my soul, I made closer relations with those people who were like-minded. and. Right. I don't need to be friends with all of them. I need to make a connection with someone. And if you're a more introverted person or socially awkward person who's listening to this and thinking, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. What I'd like, what I'd suggest to you is instead of saying I can't, which is one of those all or nothing statements, right? Try, it feels like I can't. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing is you're, you're mentioning a feeling and the feeling is telling you you can't. But that is not a, an actual statement. The reality is that we can move in any direction we want. We are all the queens on the chessboard. The idea is there are, there, our brains are telling us there might be bears. So we should, we should move slowly. I have no problem with moving slowly but better to move slowly than not move at all. You know, there's, um, there's this idea, right? That if you, if you do nothing else, but take one step, that step is infinitely more than taking zero steps. Correct. Right. Yeah. Infinitely more. Infinitely. And I'm not even a math person and that's <laughs> infinitely more. And you know, the, the idea is, Kant style thinking is top down thinking. You're looking at the thing from above and you're saying, my goal is up here, where am I all the way down there, right? If you think of it as an ice cream sundae and you have this beautiful ice cream sundae but the cherry is rotten, the first thing you see and taste is the cherry and it spoils the rest of the sundae even if the rest of the sundae is what you want. But if you start at the bottom of the sundae, oh, this is a really cool cup that this sundae's in. Oh, that's vanilla chocolate strawberry ice cream. Oh, that's fudge swirl. Oh, that's candied walnuts. Oh, that's whipped cream. Oh, that's fudge sauce. Oh, rotten cherry. Well, look how high up I got before I got disappointed, right? Our brains whip us around to think top down. Right. And that's, it's, a, it's a mindset that sets you up to fail because you're immediately looking for the flaws. You're immediately thinking about why am I not where I want to be? But if you start at the bottom of the staircase and take a step, you're that much closer to where you want to be. And it's a lot easier to give yourself credit for things you're doing away from zero than looking at it from, I am this many steps further away from a hundred, from where I want to be. Right. Yeah. That, I love that analogy that it, it, it's so useful and I hear it all the time that I can't do it because it's so big or I'm not ready to do it or I have this vision and I don't know how to do it. Well, and I always say it's who you become along the way, you know, just start taking steps in the direction and our universe will give you feedback on how great you are on course or what's going on or how, how it's unfolding. But if we don't have some momentum, it's impossible to get good information from the universe on, on, you know, kind of making our trajectory work in the way that we want to. I love that ice cream sundae, you know, that that's a great analogy because it's so true. It's so true. Last time when I go to the ice cream parlors and I get a Sunday, I check out the glass <laughs> and, I, and I get into it. And then I don't think I've ever checked it out from the top down. I've always checked out what's holding it. And when you're talking, I like, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. It's true. And the things that we do that make us happy, like eating ice cream Sunday, we naturally think bottom up, right? We tend to be happiest when we think about, when we think things from a bottom up perspective, right? Like right. if you go out, if you go out to dinner with a friend, 
You're like, I am happy to being out to dinner with my friend. That's bottom up thinking. I had nothing, now I have this thing. You don't naturally go, oh, I'm out to dinner with Sally. I wish I was out to dinner with Bob and Sue and, and Hernando and Boris and everybody else. Right. Most people don't think that way. You know, I have this one thing. Oh, what about these other 20 things I don't have? That kind of thinking makes us miserable. Yes. Right? So when we're doing our best, when we're feeling our best, we tend to be naturally engaging in the bottom up thinking. So identifying that and isolating it and trying to turn up the volume on it naturally turns our brains towards this growth stuff, towards this moving towards living our values. And it becomes a virtuous cycle. The better you feel, the better you do. The better you do, you better you feel. The better you feel, the better you do, right? Until they have a podcast and I and they're talking to us about how our podcast helped them start their podcast. And it's a whole- <laughs> All right, and, and, and the chain reaction goes on and it's a beautiful thing. So what about the person that's procrastinating stuck in the I can't, that top-down thinking, you know, because gifted people, smart people, visionaries love that I, I can't get started for whatever reason, whether it's imposter syndrome or they're just afraid or they're really good at excuses and distractions. Oh. And, and what about procrastination? Okay, so we're going to start with the bottom-up thinking mm-hmm. and procrastination feeds in the top-down thinking. Yep. Very much so. Okay, so if I don't want to procrastinate in that, that top-down thinking and I want to get over here, mm-hmm. now what do I do? So, there's three, so I have a three-step plan. I tend to think of threes for procrastination. First thing we do, we're going to name procrastination for what it is. Diane, what do you think procrastination really is? What emotion? Fear. Nailed it. Gold star for you. Yay, uh, I got a star. You in the podcast of battle. Yay. <laughs> Um, we're coming for you, Scott Barry Kaufman. We're coming for you. That's right. Here we come. Fear. I think right. procrastination is fear, and sometimes it's totally. masked fear, but it's totally mm-hmm. fear. Yeah. And, and one of the best things our brains do is our brains are in this hyper state of watching for threats, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's the sympathetic nervous system engaging when we feel threat. But we have the power to stop that process by engaging our parasympathetic nervous system. Right. And the way we do that is by naming the thing we're feeling. So I'm procrastinating, right? That's a verb. It's not a feeling. Right. So if, you know, so say you're sitting down tonight, you write a book. I got to write my book, right? I really should do the laundry. I really should call Jill. We haven't talked in a couple of days. You know, and should I sweep the baseboards? I feel like, you know, and all of a sudden your brain is spinning on all these things you can do. And when you know that procrastination is the mask that anxiety wears, you get to name that behavior for the emotion it is. You get to say, hold on, hold on a second. I am procrastinating, which means I'm afraid. What am I afraid of? Mm -hmm. When you say that thing, your parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and re-regulates your body and you stop feeling afraid. So that's step one. You name procrastination when it is procrastination equals fear. Second thing, we know that starting is much harder than going. Yes. Right? Think about starting your car. You start your car. (laughs) Then once that does it, then you don't think about the noise anymore because it's then you're just driving, right? So we set our expectations that starting is hard. Now, the research shows this. The research shows that if you can do something for two minutes, you can keep doing it. So you've got to grit your teeth for two minutes to get it done. Because once you get over that two minute anxiety threshold, then you're gonna be okay. So, you know, I literally, when I'm trying to do something I don't wanna do, and there's plenty of things I don't wanna do, mm-hmm. I set my timer for three minutes, not two, because I want to, threshold. yeah, I wanna get past it. I wanna roll down the down, down slope. Right. And so if I'm writing and I'm fighting it, I'm like, I don't wanna write. And then, and then I'll say, ding, 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 ding. And I realize, and I look up and I go, oh, I wrote two paragraphs. I'm going to keep going, right? It's the starting that's hard, not the going. And the problem is our brains get so focused on the going, we forget about how hard it is to start. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing is, and this is probably the part that's going to feel best, is reward yourself. When you, you know, one of the things that, it's funny, I, I joke about this all the time. I let my kids curse in session if they want to. You know, oftentimes kids can't curse at home or at school. So 
If they want to say bleep, 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 bleep with me, I'm cool with it. The only word I don't let my kids say is the word should. Because the yes. word should is all the possibility of could. Could is like infinite possibilities. Mm -hmm. But yeah. should is the shame plus could. Mm -hmm. So you're beating yourself up for something you haven't done. And that only makes us feel worse and therefore makes it harder to move. I should be on the basketball team. You could be on the basketball team. There are clearly some things that got in your way. You should be running a, you know, I should be running a marathon. You could be running a marathon. Why aren't you? Let's talk about the things that are getting in your way. Don't beat yourself up for something you're not doing. Talk about what's getting in your way. That moves you to a problem solving mindset that mm -hmm. talks about the fear. So the third thing, you know, once we, once we start doing the thing, we reward ourselves. We reward ourselves with it's a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, sitting on the deck, calling that calling Jill. But the idea is we move outside this, this tyranny of should, right? Yeah. I should be writing. Well, you could be writing. What's getting in your way? Right? Is it that procrastination thing? And since we have our three-step process to breaking procrastination, name it, name it for anxiety, fight through the first two minutes, and then give yourself a treat for a job well done, you're going to break that should thing because you've moved from, I'm beating myself up for not doing this, to I realized why I wasn't doing it, and now I am doing it, so now I feel good. So fight the tyranny of shoulds. I love the fighting the tyranny of shoulds and I'm sitting here and I'm, and I've heard over the years, different people and, and I hear their voices in my head as you're talking. And I always hear that. Yeah. But once I do the three minutes or the two minutes, or once I get started, then, you know, I don't want to keep going because it kicks back in. And, and it's almost like you have to be willing to do the three steps in quick succession, maybe in, initially in order to keep it going. Mm -hmm. And to remind yourself that fear doesn't get to run the show. Um, right. Because a lot of times, and like you, you said, anxiety, a lot of people use anxiety and other fear-based things as a convenient excuse or maybe even a badge of identification. And if they get on the other side of anxiety, then who am I? Right. Right. And so there's, there's, that's where when I'm listening to you, that's where all those like blockages are. That's where, you know, as you start unpacking it, you start seeing all the little tendrils of things that impact what's on the surface. Right. And, um, and I like that. I like, cause it's the three steps you could do quickly if you need to, you know, right. I, um, I sometimes do, I do a lot of it cause I do a lot of writing and I um, have these partners where we do like little hour long sessions where we say hi for a few minutes. What mm -hmm. are you working on? What am I working on? Then we work for like 50. And in the last five minutes, oh, well, how'd you do? Well, I'm naturally competitive with myself. So if I'm working on a book, in fact, I'm working on a book now that it's getting ready to come out about um, spiritual giftedness oh, and, wow. and twice exceptionality. And, um, and it's coming out way better than I thought. You know, it's like one of those where it's like, woo, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm known for my spiritual giftedness and working with people with that. And it's not a big conversation yet. And, um, so people have asked me for it. So I started working on it, right? Well, what I'm noticing is as I'm doing this, working on this book, that I will, um, when I do my little working sessions with my friends, I'll look and I'll see my word count wherever I am in the book. And then I race myself. Oh, I love it. And I just open the channel and how fast can I go? I'll edit it later. Mm -hmm. And I was doing like, the, a couple of days ago, I did 1,200 words in that 50 minutes. I mean, that's faster than I've ever typed. Other times it's five or 600. But what I notice is if there's another person there and there's an engagement, that sense of community with somebody, we're like-minded because we're both writing, even though it's totally separate topics, mm -hmm. but it's the same behavior, then that competitive spirit in me can come out a little bit more because all I'm doing is racing the clock in my own little word count thing. <laughs> And I'm finding that it's really serving staying out of this tyranny of should, like I should get the book done. I should get this blog written. I should, it's helping me having that extra engagement where I can pull it off because um, I was starting to say, you should be doing all these things. And I'm like, I don't know if I should be, I could be, you know, and, and um, but when I start added that little bit of extra connection, that community piece, it changed everything. 
So I'm listening when I'm listening to you, I'm like, oh yeah, I just did that kind of. That's what he's talking about. <laughs> so let's talk about um we've talked a little bit about community and connection and getting out of stopping ourselves with procrastination. But one of the other things that that I really think causes pain and hurt in, in smart people, and since we're talking about why smart people hurt, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on being somebody who's different and we know we're different, even if we don't know how or why, or even if we're a visionary or a gifted person and we've never used that language before, they're listening to you and they can relate to every story you're saying. And then they go, but I'm not gifted. I don't know what that means. Like they, they're not yet where they can put it together, but they understand. What about having that sense of meaning? Like what our value is, what our, what our meaning, you know, meaning for us in the world would be, because I think there's a crisis in that sometimes with people. And what, what are your thoughts about developing meaning, identifying our meaning, living with a sense of meaning? And, and how important is that really for a smart person to help them with that hurt, that pain? Yeah. I mean, that is, that is the core question. You know, I mean, the the idea of you know so if gifted people crave anything they crave authenticity mm-hmm. right no patience for meaningless small talk no patience for the the nitty gritty details we're idea people right give me the my fields medal winning idea that is going to get me on the cover of mathematics monthly you know not the 17 page application process for the grant I'm going to need to get this research done. It's like, ah, right. So the idea is when we find the things that make our souls, that make, that make us happy, we move in those directions, right? And in moving in those directions, we find communities and try to engage in those communities. Now to gauge in, to engage in a community authentic, that, authentically right (laughs) um to engage in a community authentically we we go through a self-assessment um one of the things that i think about a lot in terms of engaging in communities is is leadership right Mm -hmm. so i tend to find myself in leadership positions and i because i have a i have some natural leadership qualities And B, because I try really hard. And C, because I'm good at stuff. And I've realized at this point in my life that the best way for me to authentically engage in a community is to be vice president of something. I'm not good at being totally in charge. I'm great at being the second in command. I'm great at being the sounding board. I'm great at getting you dispatching people to do things. I'm not great at having to make all the hard decisions myself. And that's how I authentically engage. But that comes from years of engagement with things. So right. one of the things is to trust the process, to understand that it's a developmental curve. The things you need when you're 20 are not the things you need when you're 30, 40, 45, whatever. If you want to dance, maybe you're not somebody who goes for the, the solo in the Swan Princess. Maybe you're somebody who works the lights. Maybe you're somebody who sells tickets. Maybe you're somebody who works with works to wrangle the little kids to make sure they're on stage where they're supposed to be. There's no wrong way to engage in a community if you're engaging in it authentically. We get into this mindset, right, where the only way to be a part of a community is to be the best. I had a kid tell me today, you know, what's the point of playing basketball if I can't be LeBron James? there's only one LeBron James and he's probably in the 99.9th percentile of basketball players ever. So you're telling me that you can't play basketball unless you're one of the top five basketball players of all time. Then by that logic, no one should play basketball. That's a, and it's absurd. I said, what do you like about playing basketball? He's like, I like shooting three pointers. I want to be, I want to be like Steph Curry. Cool. So maybe you find a basketball team that needs you to shoot three pointers. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Don't, you know, this idea of like, don't be somebody you're not, that curse can hold us from joining the communities we want to join. But once we're in those communities, it can rear its ugly head again. Right. Like, oh, the only way for me to be in the theater is to be, you know, 
to be the lead in all the plays. Yeah, I said, I'm not a leading man on the theater. I'm a comic relief guy. I like being the comic relief guy. I steer into that. You know, I'm much happier being the goof, the fool, than I am singing the aria because, well, once again, you don't want me to sing. But that's like, that's how I engage authentically. I teach, I laugh, I joke, I tell stories. You know, give yourself give yourself time after you do something to reflect on it. What parts of this worked for me? What felt good? What felt okay? And what didn't feel so good? When you ask yourself those questions, you make space for your brain to, to hold those experiences. Mm-hmm. And not as, oh, this was bad because this bad thing happened. You acknowledge that every time you do something, there's some good stuff, there's some okay stuff, and there's some bad stuff. Mm-hmm when you make that part of it, you, you take that feedback and it always moves you in a more authentic direction. Wow. That's, that's really amazing. That is really good advice. I could sit here and ask you questions all day long. Um, <laughs> 10 hour podcast. And it's, well, the thing that I'm really enjoying about listening to what you're saying is a couple things. One is because you're a psychologist that actually is animated and has really practical things to say that doesn't just run up in the head and say all this theory that is not really applicable to the listeners and the people out there. I want, I want everyone who's listening to us to leave this conversation feeling hope and feeling confident that they can try one thing or have one thing work in their favor to brighten their life, right? And mm-hmm. you've been nailing it. Well, every question is like, oh, that's perfect. Oh, that's perfect. I just really like this. And it's interesting, y'all, because I just met Matt a little while ago. I have intuitively asked all these questions and he had no idea and there's no script. We don't do scripts. We don't do scripts. We are talking from a really cool experience. And so I have a couple questions. I'm watching the time and I have way more questions. So I think you might have to come back for a second episode. Yay! Oh, good. That means it. That's a yes. Because drop like a to be continued on the. <laughs> maybe because there is more I want to ask you about, and I want to be sensitive to everybody's, the listener's time and our time. But I have a question I want to ask you. Please and thank you. What is the most memorable food you've ever eaten? <gasps> oh, okay. Can can I be a can I be a jerk and say two things? <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right. So when, when I lived in Australia, I got to eat fried scorpions. And that's the sort of thing that sticks with you, right? Fried scorpions. Fried scorpions. So that is the, that is the number one thing. Did you like it? It was funny. It didn't really taste like anything. It, because scorpions have an exoskeleton. It's just goop inside. And so it was just, it tastes like fried goop. All right. I like fried things. And. You know, it just, it's, it looks creepy, you know, with the, the, the stinger and all that, but yeah, it just, it was like more, the, the visual experience was more interesting than the flavor, the astronomical experience of it. Okay. All right. I had to ask. I had to ask. Okay. Now, what was the second thing? The second thing <laughs> is the, um, so I love to cook myself, right? I, I love, I, I love cooking and I had always said that. I would be a good cook if I could make a risotto because they're hard to make and they require attention to detail and stick to itiveness and things that I have to really flex and work on myself. So the first time I made a risotto from scratch and I ate it with my wife, I like I remember thinking like I've done it. I have crossed that threshold. I am a good cook. So fried scorpions and homemade risotto. Homemade risotto that you made. That I made, and I, I'm very proud of it. Oh, that's really, really amazing. So I'm glad that you're willing to come back for a second episode because I have more questions about why smart people hurt, like a part two is coming because I have a lot more things I want to talk about, but I also think it's time for everybody to kind of digest what we've talked about because you have covered a lot of ground, um, far reaching ground in my mind. And so I thank you for your time and your expertise and coming on the show. And is there anything on your heart that you kind of wanted to say that I didn't ask about, or that kind of feels unfinished? Cause I like us to feel done when we're done knowing that we're going to come back, but still there might be something. Is there anything that you would like to say or share before we close? 
So two things. Mm -hmm. The first thing is that when you're a very sensitive person, whether you're an empath, whether, whether you're a gifted kid, whether you just feel your feelings really deeply, your brain is going to tell you that the feeling of a feeling means you're doing something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I feel pain, so therefore I must be broken or therefore I'm not doing the right thing, right? And the existence of a feeling is only telling you, is only telling you that a feeling exists. So please, please, and we'll del delve into this in episode two, but don't take the existence of anxiety or fear or even depression to mean you're doing the wrong thing because you're not. Those are parts of the process. You know, if you are standing, if you're listening to this podcast in your car and you are outside the community theater and you are ready to go in there and read to be Seymour in Little Shop of Horrors and, you, and you're like, I can't do it. I must not be ready because I'm afraid. I'm going to sit here and tell you that the fear is telling you you're ready. Yes. So the existence of the fear doesn't undo your good intentions. And the second thing is, Diane, just to thank you for creating this space for us to sit and talk about awesome, important things. And I mean, like I said before, I've been a fan for a long time. To sit here is so cool. And I, I can't wait for part two. Oh, I can't either. And, and thank you for your kind words. So everybody, you have been listening to Dr. Matt Zakreski. Nailed it. I got it. Oh, yes. And he has been sharing amazing wisdom with us about why smart people hurt. And there's much more to come. I have more questions. Our conversation is so rich and deep because smart people do hurt a lot. And we really want to help all of you, everybody, live their vision and feel hopeful for the future. So Matt, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for being part of Someone Gets Me. And in the show notes, everybody, is Matt's website and his Facebook information and his bio. And so connect with him. Let him know you heard him on the show. He'll be happy to reach back out to you. And I watch on Facebook and I see the things he posts. And it's really amazing to be inspired by somebody who gets me. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Remember everybody to put your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star and you're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there and let your light shine and remind yourself that with every breath you take, you are beautiful, you are lovable, and you are capable. And we'll see you next time when someone gets me. Be well.